a little light this morning in attendance, but we'll go ahead and uh, get back into teaching on the outsiders. Uh, one thing I didn't show last week, we talked about John Huss last week, and in Czechoslovakia, which is now the Republic of Czech, I think is what they call it, uh, they still celebrate, uh, I think it's called John Huss Day or however they put it in that language, and through the years there were several coins actually uh, minted in his, with his image, uh, let's see about four different, I don't know if this is front and back, I think it's front and back of two, or maybe it's three coins all together. I just wanted to show you these. Uh, so it is very, oh, he is very well known, although I'd never heard of him. Maybe some of y'all had. Uh, very well known in that area of Eastern Europe. Uh, so now we're going to go into a study on Felix Manns. But before we get into the study, I'm going to go over a little bit over uh, baptism. And we need to... Uh, refresh in our minds about baptism because this uh, he is very directly related to a baptism his martyr that because the reason he was martyred is uh, strictly because of baptism in Matthew 3:11 uh, it says John uh, the Baptist says I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So uh, there is a baptism of the Holy Spirit that we receive uh, uh, when we are saved. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit moves in. And that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's once. One baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then uh, to show that we are saved, there is the baptism of water. That is where uh, we are in a pool of water and we are submersed in water and brought back up, signifying the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 3 and 21, The like figure wherein to even bat baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of filth and of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it's not the baptism of water that saves us, but it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Romans 6, 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So it is, uh, we have the uh, example of baptism, but we also have the command of baptism in Matthew 28, 19. Then Acts 2 and 41, again the example, then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So, Today, baptism, uh, even Baptists don't really, for the most part, understand uh, just how dear baptism is. And as we go through the study of Felix Manns, I hope that we uh, all gather a keener sense of the importance of following in believers' baptism. Felix Mann, uh, born 1498, lived to 1527. And quote is, and thus I close. Sorry, I just messed my whole thing up here. Wow, went all the way to the bottom. Sorry about that, y'all. And thus I close with this, I will firmly adhere to Christ and trust in him who is acquainted with all my needs and can deliver me out of it. You know, through life we have to uh, ask ourselves what doctrines are worth one's life. And you heard our pastor say that, that some things 
you, do, you just have to stand on. You can't give up on. Some things are, are preferences, and then there's doctrines, and there's some doctrines that are more important than other doctrines. Uh, but what is worth giving your life for? Is it only salvation by grace alone, or is it also the very nature of what constitutes a New Testament church? Also, how far should one go in accepting Scripture alone as the authority for faith and practice? And should that answer change if the state is willing to accept partial adherence to Scripture but forbids full obedience? And this is what we're going to run into with Felix Manns. He wanted to stick strictly to the Scriptures, and there were some that said, well, we'll go along with it as far as the state says it's okay. These are the questions the Anabaptist martyrs answered for us during the Reformation. We'll discuss the meaning of Anabaptists later on in the lesson. We know that these reformers risked and, and some gave their lives to reclaim the gospel of it being clouded over the years by the state church. But what we sometimes forget is that even the reformers, for the most part, retained a strong allegiance to the idea of a state church. The early reformers, uh, for a lot of them anyway, uh, they said, well, the you know, church, church doesn't have the gospel right. They don't have the plan of salvation right, and we need to straighten that out, but we don't need to leave the church. We still need to be, we still need to be, still needs to be one church, and it needs to be a state-run church. And basically the way it was in, it was the church oversaw the government and so it was all really one uh, model, one thing together. It wasn't, it wasn't really separate at all. Rather than a pure New Testament church, they envisioned a Reformed Catholic church. And when it became apparent to them that the Catholic church was unwilling to reform, they developed churches with different doctrine but similar, but similar to the Catholic church. They still had the ties to the state still had ties to the Catholic Church. Because of this, they also struggled to allow freedom of religion and felt threatened by those who talked differently than they did, especially the Anabaptists. So there were some that they reformed to a certain degree that they could get by with without persecution, and then when they saw others reforming more and going more strictly by the Word of God, they didn't like it. I don't know if they felt like it was endangering them, uh, that they would be also persecuted with them. So they actually joined the church, the Catholic church, the state church, into persecuting these reformers that were willing to go further into following the word of God than they were. Consequently, some of the reformers actually persecuted, even executed Anabaptists. Felix Manns was the first of these Anabaptist martyrs to die at the hands of the Reformers. Manns was born in Zurich, Switzerland, the illegitimate son of a Catholic priest. Now, you say, well, how do Catholics have, how, how do Catholic priests have children? They're not supposed to get married. This is well-documented. You can look it up on Google, however you want to look it up. Uh, there were many that did. There were actually some popes uh, that... Uh, popes that were married. Some popes had children illegitimately, and it's well documented. Uh, but he was one of these that, uh, Catholic son of a Catholic priest. Felix Manns, again born 1498, 1527, 29 years old when he was martyred. He was. This is a, a drawing of him. Felix Manns, first Anabaptist martyr. Man was sentenced to die on the 5th of January, 1527. Zurich prosecutors decide the punishment for the second baptism was third baptism or drowning. So he wasn't burned to stake, but he was drowned. And we'll explain what second baptism and third baptism, what, what they're calling the second and third baptism is later on in the lesson. Uh, man's hands were bound to his knees with a stick thrust between his arms and his legs, thrown into icy waters of the Lamat River. And this is actually a drawing of them going out. He was actually put into a boat, taken out into the river, and thrown overboard where his he could not move his legs and his arms. And it wasn't just him. He just happened to be the first one. And the leader of these 
There was about a dozen that day also uh, drowned. This is a this is a plaque that's by the Lamat River, and it reads, translated English, it reads, "Here in the middle of the Lamat, Felix Manns and five other Anabaptists were drowned during the Reformation period, between 1527 and 1532. The last Anabaptist to be drowned was Hans Landis, executed in 1614." We don't know much about his early life, but it seems to know uh, Greek, Hebrew, and Latin. And in 1522, he was studying uh, these languages with Ulrich Swingley. And Ur Swingley was also a reformer at the time, and he learned a lot from Swingley in the beginning. Uh, from coming to Zurich in 1519 as a Catholic priest who had already understood the gospel and was determined to preach it, to leading the city to break with the Catholic Church in 1520, Swingley was a deliberate, causative leader who endeared a whole city, including its city council, to himself and brought about a peaceful reform. So he was a reformer that came in, in Zurich, and he led basically the whole city, including uh, the council uh, to follow him. Part of his approach was, just like some of the other reformers was, was to find young men willing uh, to learn the gospel and teach them uh, to preach the gospel and teach them uh, how to study uh, other languages that they may have a clearer understanding. Uh, he introduced them to the Greek New Testament, which had just come out by Erasmus. I think that is on that uh, paper that I give you with the dates. I'm not sure if it is or not. But see, that, now this is where they were able to study it better. Before uh, the Greek New Testament, you had to translate, all people had was the, it had to be translated out of Latin. So it was actually somebody had translated from Greek to Latin, and then it had to be translated back into Greek, and then from Greek to the, your language. So now with the Erasmus New Testament, you have the it in Greek, and then it could be directly. When you, every time you translate, of course, you lose something. Sort of like those old VHS tapes when you used to record it and you record again and you record again, or a cassette tape, uh, audio, you record it and you record it. It start, Eventually, you don't have anything. You can't even understand it or see it. Same thing would happen with a translation. If you go from five, through five different languages back and forth, there's some translation that is lost. Conrad Grebel was one of the early participants in the group, and Felix Manns followed. In 1522, both men understood the gospel and came to Christ through Swingley's teaching. So that would have put uh, Manns at 24 years old when he got saved. Also, through Swingley's teaching, both men came to the conviction that the Scripture was the final authority that we should follow instead of the church. Over the next year, however, Grebel and Manns found it increasingly difficult to trust Swingley. Although he claimed that Scripture was the final authority, he deferred in practice to the Zurich City Council in doctrinal matters, eventually contradicting himself on such issues as, the ma as mass and the use of images in the church in order to stay in line with the wishes of the council. So although they, have, they in the beginning, followed him when he started saying things that they didn't like, he, thought he went back on what he said. Privately, he shared his scriptural views, but publicly he acquiesced to the wishes of the council, seemingly believing that in time they would come around if he would just take it slow. After publicly held dispute set forth by the city council in which Swingley completely capitulated his previously stated positions to the direction of the council, Grebel and Manns knew they no longer could work with Swingley. So although he started to reform and got these men started uh, in the word of God and trusting in the word of God, then he went back on his word because he didn't want any persecution. Remember, when he started, there was no persecution, so he was fine. But when the persecution came, he backed 
off on what he said and, and completely uh, went back. Over the following year, Grevel and Manns and a few others continued to study the Bible and preach the gospel in the region. They found themselves studying the question of baptism. Now, we talked earlier about two types of baptism, spiritual baptism and water baptism. When you receive Christ as your Savior, you were baptized spiritually into the body of Christ. When you got saved, when we say baptized by the Holy Spirit, that means that you are baptized into the body of Christ, into the church, not into Currytown Baptist, not into Faith Baptist or whatever church, but you are baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ, the church. 1 Corinthians 12, 27, Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Once you're saved, you're in the church. When you're baptized by water, you are baptized into the local church body. So when we do baptism here, we do it, and that is the way uh, that you gain membership. If you haven't been baptized, if you've already been baptized, uh, then you gain membership by statement of being so baptized and previously. It's difficult today to understand how could it be such a, such a contrast in opinion? How could baptism be the reason for uh, execution? Now, we have denominations today that, that don't baptize like we do. They, they disagree on the part of baptism. And, uh, but we, would never, we never think about it being so strongly that we would kill one another over it. And because being baptized by water is not uh, a part, is not how you get saved. Uh, but back then, there's, we're, going to we're going to study the reason why it was so, uh, the, the dispute was so great. As mentioned earlier, the reformers did not necessarily have a problem with there being a state church. They simply had a problem with that church teaching Catholic doctrine as a means for salvation. They just wanted the reform to reform the system that was already in place, and a key component, component of keeping this system running was infant baptism. So back then, almost the entire almost all of Europe was baptized as an infant. When you're born, you just that was just the way you did. You got baptized. And you're in the church. The problem with that, most of the time, it never was followed by a belief in Jesus Christ and recognizing him as your Savior. That was accepted as salvation, and your way into heaven was being baptized as a baby. So, But what it also did was because there was a connection of the government and the church it kept everybody in line with the government and committed to the government because once you were born you, you were in the church but you were also in, in agreement with the government so you were all brought into to one uh, entity they realized that Grebel and Mans however were coming to scripture understanding for all century of practice, infant baptism was not once to be found in Scripture. And you won't, it's, it's not in there. Furthermore, they realized that believers' baptism, baptism by immersion after a profession of faith, was both taught and practiced throughout the New Testament. Finally, they realized that a New Testament church was not comp comprised simply of a group of citizens who happened to be born in the same town. Rather, it was comprised of saved and baptized people who gathered in shared allegiance to Christ and doctrinal agreement. So when you're depending on the infant baptism as salvation, then you, and you don't, you're never taught anything, and most of them couldn't read the Word of God. Even if they'd had it, they couldn't have read it. So they were in allegiance to the church and to the state. Those who believed in infant baptism called those who held opposing position 
Anabaptist. Anna is Latin for the word re, thus the literal definition, literal definition is re-baptizers. Now, the reason they called them re-baptizers is because basically everybody there, as I said, had already been baptized as a baby. But now you have these reformers coming out saying that you need to make a profession of faith to see Christ as your Savior, and then you need to be baptized. So then anybody that get, got baptized in believer's baptism was being baptized the second time. So they called them Anabaptists or rebaptizers. An infant baptism was not baptism at all, but merely dipping in a Romish bath. When you think about it, not practicing believer's baptism put swingly in an odd position. As I said, he had, he had claimed that Scripture, earlier had claimed that Scripture is what they needed to go by, but when he disagreed with, the, with baptizing, with believer's baptism, because the council didn't like it, he, he's actually, you know, he's, he's catching himself in eye. Did he believe it or didn't he believe it? Or did he believe it and then simply would not state it anymore because he feared the persecution? Now, before we go any further on baptism, let me say this. And this is a, a different lesson. We're not going to go into it. But infants, babies, children, and individuals never reaching the mental to, mental Mentally capable of understanding salvation do not go to hell when they die. Now, sometimes when people, they want to take a stand so strong on baptism, they'll say, well, if, if they never got saved and got baptized, then they're going to hell. If a baby dies when they're a day old, they didn't get, they're, they're going, there's people that believe they go to hell. That's not scriptural. As I said, that's a different lesson. But I didn't want you to think that I was saying that babies went to hell because they weren't baptized or saved. They do not. Salvation is a personal relationship with the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. The relationship is initiated by the Holy Spirit when he convicts you of your sin. You do not start it. The Holy Spirit starts your salvation when he convicted you of your sin. The relationship is completed when you accept the offer of forgiveness of your sin, when you trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as payment for your sin, when you believe Jesus as who he said he was and that he will forgive you. After you believe that Jesus will save you and you ask him to save you, you must believe he has saved you. It's, it's not saying the words. It's not saying, okay, I believe that, and I'm going to say this, and so no. You believe what the Bible says, and then you believe Jesus carried out, the Holy Spirit carried out what he said, that he saved you and forgave you. Then you are a child of God. The relationship is sealed by the very one that initiated the relationship, the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit began, and the Holy Spirit sealed it. So we have no control over, we can't do it on our own, and we can't get out on our own. We can't get out. If we're saved, we're saved. Baptism is not salvation. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that, and I'm talking about water baptism, that water baptism is a part of salvation. Baptism is God's ordained, biblically taught, and biblically practiced command for believers to follow. Obeying the command of baptism shows to the world around you that you believe and trust in the death, burial, and resurrection. So following in believer's baptism is to show to the world that you've been saved, that you believe what the Bible says about salvation, that you believe Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again. Since there is no salvation relationship, wait a minute, there is no way that an infant can become a part of a salvation relationship with Jesus Christ. And what I just said, an infant can't do it. They can't understand the Holy Spirit conviction. They can't... Uh, believe the Holy Spirit can be. They can't read the Bible. They can't understand the Bible. So they cannot, as a baby, enter into salvation. Since there is no salvation relationship, there is no command to be baptized. So there is no command for infant baptism. There is no reason for infant baptism. 
Baptism of an infant is a false proclamation that a salvation experience has taken place. You only baptize after somebody receives salvation. So to baptize anybody is to proclaim that they are saved, and to, proclaim, and to baptize a baby is to proclaim that that baby is saved. To simply uh, be talking to a crowd of people and say, does anybody want to be baptized? And you go baptize them. You don't ask them if they've been saved. They've never been saved. They just want to get baptized. And you baptize somebody to be simply to be a member of a local church, that's false. You don't baptize to get somebody to be on church roll. You baptize, you offer baptism so that they have the uh, opportunity to follow in believers' baptism. And herein lies one of the dangers of a state church. It cannot be a true New Testament local church. And this is why believers' baptism became so important to Grebel and Manns. They realized that there was no way that they could follow the infant baptism and believe that the Bible is the Word of God. Over the next several months, these two men, as well as several others who shared their commitment to Scripture, began to meet. They continued studying Scripture privately, preaching publicly, and raising the issue of baptism and the New Testament church. Now, they could have went and simply done it in private, but they didn't think that's what they ought to do. They thought they ought to do it because they were proclaiming as bapti water baptism as saying, I believe in Jesus Christ, and I, I, I'm a member of his church, and this is how I'm showing it because I'm following the Bible in believer's baptism. On January 17, 1525, the city council decided to settle the matter with a formal hearing. Manns and Grebel were among those presented as radical viewpoint of believer's baptism, while Swingley and others argued for infant baptism. The council came down strongly on the side of infant baptism, issuing a twofold ordinance that should serve to hinder the Baptists. First, they declared that all parents in Zurich must baptize their children within one week of birth or be banished from the city. So they're not only saying don't be, don't be re-baptized, but you're going to baptize your baby, and you're going to do it before, by the time they're a week old. Second, they declared that to pra practice believers' baptism was to choose imprisonment. Mans, Grebel, George Blollock, and nearly a dozen others chose the latter. On the night of January 21st, 1525, four days after the council's decree, these men went to Felix Mann's homes, prayed for courage and faithfulness to Christ, and were baptized. First, Grebel baptized Bollock, and then Bollock baptized the rest. Thus, on one cold January, the First Baptist Church, Zurich, was formed. The local church, as a body of saved, baptized believers, isn't an obscure doctrine in the New Testament. Of course, we read uh, those scriptures about uh, what the Bible says about being baptized. They were not foolishly grandstanding. They were simply placing the same value on the church as Christ did. Now, the following months, and uh, very difficult to attract, but several things happened in those few months, and we'll go ahead and skip some of this. Uh, anywhere he was imprisoned, he escaped. He was put in prison again. He escaped. He was put in prison. Somebody let him out. He was put in prison, trial. He, he wasn't convicted. Uh, one historian said that practically uh, every uh, jail in, in the area he was in at one time. Let's see. I'm trying to get finished here. Finally, in December of 1526, a man, Mans, along with Bollock, was arrested in a forest and imprisoned for the last, final time. Grebel, meantime, had died of the plague before this happened. On January 5, 1527, Manns was sentenced to death by drowning for the crime of baptizing and through baptism assembling a church. Because he had become involved in anabaptism, because he confessed having said that he wanted to gather those who wanted to accept Christ and follow him and unite himself with them through baptism, so that he and his followers separated themselves from the Christian church. 
as they're saying that if you what, did what they did and got rebaptized, that you were taking yourself out of the Christian church when actually you were forming a Christian church. On the same afternoon that Manz was sentenced, he was taken to the river Lamat for his execution. From prison to the river, he witnessed to all he could of saving faith in Christ alone, and he praised God that he, a sinner, was forgiven by Christ and assured a home in heaven. His mother and brother were among those on the shore, and as he was put into the fishing boat to be taken out, they called out, encouraging him to be faithful to Christ. The executioner tied man's hands behind his knees and pushed a pole between so he could not free himself. And as he was tied, he offered up his last words, Into thy hands, O God, I commend my spirit. He was rowed out into the middle of the river and pushed overboard. He was not yet 30 years old, yet in less than one year's time he had been instrumental in starting the first Anabaptist church in Zurich, as well as preaching and planting Anabaptist churches throughout Switzerland. Mans and thousands of Anabaptist martyrs freely gave their lives for Christ. Now, we've all seen movies and heard of Christians being thrown to the lions and the Romans killing Christians uh, in the early 1st and 2nd century. More Anabaptists or more Baptists was killed in the dark ages for baptizing than Christians were killed then. So it wasn't just, it wasn't just uh, him and his few followers. It was thousands. Some were burned to stake. Some were drowned. Other ways of execution. One of the most remarkable traits of Anabaptists, besides their commitment to Scripture as a source of doctrine and practice, was their understanding of religious liberty, even against the backdrop of the Middle Ages in Europe. So we'll close there. We might bring out a little more next week. That's probably about all. But so, as I said in the beginning, I hope this helps us to understand why we're Baptists and understand how important it is and understand that people died for the right for us to be follow in believer's baptism and no, I know, know there's contrast about now, but nothing like it is now, nothing like it was then. But people have given their lives, thousands of people have given their lives over the centuries so that we may have what we have now. Let's pray. Lord, we thank, thank you, you for this you. day that you've given us. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that, that we have the word of God. We don't have to any longer, Lord, uh, read the Latin or the Greek. or Lord, we have it in our language that we can understand. Lord, as we, as we take that understanding,